My name is Jan Wong, and I'm a journalist. I write for the Globe and Mail. I used to do a column called Lunch With, and now I write features. And I I'm, think I'm somewhere between an agnostic and an atheist, but I'm definitely a moralist. I grew up in Montreal. I was the second of four kids, and my father had several restaurants. They were quite well known in Montreal. The most famous was Bill Wong's on Carey Boulevard. And my mother was a housekeeper. I mean, not, not a housekeeper, a housewife, but she kept the house. She did all the work. And so we had a very traditional 50s kind of um, upbringing. And we lived in a middle-class neighborhood in NDG. And it was interesting because I wasn't uh, part of any real Chinese community. I did ethnic things like, of course, I had to take Chinese lessons. And I took Chinese dance. But essentially, I had a very Canadian upbringing. We were part of a school where I was the only Chinese kid in my class. The community was very small in those days in Montreal. My family wasn't religious, but somewhere along the way, my mother, it was my mother, decided that we were Canadian. Uh, my parents were born in Canada, and so she wanted us to be as Canadian as possible, and she thought that being Canadian meant going to church. She had not been raised in a religious way, but she figured, well, Protestant, right? We go to the Protestant school board of Montreal School, so let's just go to those Protestant churches. and. We didn't know what that meant, so we just picked the church that was closest to us. And as we moved, we <laughs> went to whatever church was closest to us. So I, as a child, went to uh, uh, Rosedale United Church. I went to Cote St. Luke uh, First Baptist Church. And I went to Montreal West Presbyterian Church. And I really had no idea that <laughs> these were different. I just thought it was like the name, <laughs> you know. I had no idea they actually had different um, policies and different beliefs. So, uh, but she said she didn't want to baptize us. She felt that this was a decision that we could make on our own when we got older. And um, so I went to Sunday school, and I really enjoyed it. It was fun. I was a very obedient um, kid when I was little, not now. And um, I like Sunday school because it was orderly. You got to dress up in those days. You know, you, you had a, a hat, you know, with those uh, fake fabric flowers on them. And it was like really fun because I could wear a hat. I could wear, I had white gloves. I mean, it's, you talk about it now and you think that's so bizarre. So Sunday school was a, a chance for me to dress up. And it was a chance, we had arts and crafts and we also had wonderful stories. I always like stories. I'm a journalist, and so I, I think from an early age I loved hearing people tell stories, and the Bible stories were the greatest. They were wonderful, and I liked the music too. But um, I, I didn't stay a Christian because as I got older and I started to go to the sermons, when I sort of finished Sunday school and moved into the adult part of the church, and I began to listen to the sermons for the first time. I didn't like them. I found them a very boring, very boring. You know, you'd go through all this stuff, hymn this, Bible reading that, and more hymns and more Bible readings, and then finally he'd talk, and it was such a letdown uh, because it wasn't interesting. And um, I didn't like the message either. I can't remember what the message was, but I didn't really like it. I thought this is not applicable to what I want to do. And so I gradually stopped going to church. While I was at McGill University, I was interested in Maoism. Uh, I think part of it was the times. It was the early 70s and university campuses were in ferment. The Vietnam War was still going on and a lot of young people were in protest mode. 
But I think that Maoism actually has a very similar roots to Christianity and other great religions because it really is about all people being equal, about not oppressing others. Well, that was the theory of Maoism, just as it's the theory of Christianity. I see very great similarities. And so I think I, I naturally fell into Maoism. I was uh, majoring in Chinese studies. I was looking for my roots, that was the time, because I had grown up so Canadian. And then I was, by the time I was at university, I thought, well, what am I? I was trying to figure out, am I Canadian or am I Chinese? And so I started doing Asian studies. And of course, China was in the midst of the Cultural Revolution at that point, so Maoism became a key to understanding China. And I found it very attractive because it was really black and white. It was completely moralistic and very condemning of, of, of wrong. Like they didn't, um, in a way it was like Christianity in its early days <laughs> where they would burn heretics at the stake. Maoism was quite like that. If you were a heretic, uh, you would go to the labor camp or you would undergo uh, criticism sessions, self-criticism sessions. I thought that was pretty good. And so sitting in my classes and going to speeches, political speeches, I just took it all at face value. I did not understand that the world wasn't like that. In 1972, when I was 19, I went to China. And I was in the middle of McGill studies, and I went because I had planned to go for the summer, just as, you know, I thought I'd better see what this country's like. And um, I got a visa, but my friend didn't get a visa. My friend was an Australian older woman. She was white, and we wanted to go together. And they turned her down, but they took me because they thought, I was Chinese. <laughs> the Chinese embassy looked at me and goes, Chinese? So they gave me a visa. They didn't give her a visa. And I had to make a decision. Am I going to go by myself? And I was scared. But uh, part of my nature is if you should go, you should go. Like, how can you not go? That's why I'm a reporter, I think. You have to do these things. So I, I decided, well, I'll just go. It was the height of the Cultural Revolution. And China was basically a, a hermetically sealed place. There were no... Western outside influences. And luckily for me, there was one American Chinese uh, woman there uh, who was also uh, selected to study. So she was like my life raft. And she was the only person I could speak English to. And the two of us, she was even more radical than I was. I was very radical. Uh, I was much a, a believer in Maoism. She was even more than I was. And um, so we spent that first year together learning Chinese and learning about Maoism and um, doing hard labor. We wanted to do hard labor because we, we were told it was good um, for, the, for reforming your thinking, getting rid of all those silly bourgeois thoughts. And in a way, it's like Christianity because I think there's a, a belief in Christianity that you should be austere, that you should not um, go overboard and be extravagant, and you should, you know, tone down your life because material things are not supposed to be important. That is why, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth. So all of this, you know, at the time I didn't realize, of course, that maybe the reason I was falling deeply in love with Maoism was because as a kid I had been indoctrinated with Bible stories. They're both indoctrinations. There's nothing wrong with indoctrinations as long as it's good indoctrination. And I, and I think that Maoism also is not as bad as people think because it is a morality. It is a kind of way of life where you shouldn't be selfish. Uh, you should think of the other people. Of course, it was taken to its extremes and abused. I learned a lot about human nature. I learned a lot about myself, too. I learned that things are not always what they seem to be, and that human nature is not easily changed. The whole point of Maoism was to create a new kind of man, meaning woman too, but they wanted people to stop being selfish, to work for the common good. They had communes, which were agricultural co-ops, really, in which everybody would work together and then equally divide the prophets. 
And I thought, that's great, that's fantastic, but it doesn't work. What I learned was that human nature uh, needs to be controlled in the sense that you cannot let people step on other people. You have to protect the weakest part of society. At one point, when someone asked me for help in leaving China, a stranger, uh, another student on the university campus approached me and said, I want to go to the States. Will you help me? She approached me and the American, uh, the only American who was studying with me. And we didn't know what to do. We wanted to stay in China. We did not understand why anyone would want to leave. We were still very naive and young, and we didn't know about all the labor camps. We didn't understand the totalitarian nature of China. We were going there like, you know, idealists. And so we thought, what do we do? And then we said, well, what would a Chinese do? Because we were trying to be Chinese. We were learning Chinese. We were dressing Chinese. We thought China was a utopia. And we thought, well, we better tell our teachers because we want them to help straighten out her thinking. She's wrong. She should stay here. It's a wonderful country. And um, we had been criticized, too. I had been criticized for reading Time magazine. Like, I'm supposed to be studying. My goal was supposed to learn Chinese, so I would be actually criticized. Why are you reading English? This is very bad. So I thought it would be punishment like that. So we told our teachers. And we didn't know what had happened to her. I only found out much later as a journalist. I went to my classmates and I said, what happened? Do you know this kid? And she had been expelled. They kept it a secret from us. We had no idea. We didn't know her. She had been expelled and um, sent back to her village in disgrace. So it's very strange. Most people don't get to find out about consequences sometimes. I would never have found out that this had happened if I had not been a reporter and also gone back to China many years later. They would not have told me this. So I learned, I think, that you can have these good intentions, but sometimes you're wrong. Like you don't see the whole picture. You meant well, you didn't get it. I tried to become as Chinese as I could. That was my goal, I think. I was looking for my roots. In the end, I concluded that I'm not Chinese. I'm Canadian. That was one of the great uh, things that I learned from living in China, that I uh, may look Chinese, but many Canadians look Chinese. And that doesn't mean I'm a hyphenated Canadian. I'm a full-fledged Canadian. I think when I was pregnant with my second child, I was working in Beijing as a correspondent. My gynecologist was in Hong Kong. And because I was so old in this pregnancy, I was in that high-risk group for Down syndrome. So I, um, I had amniocentesis, which is a, a way of checking. It's a genetic, genetic test. and. Um, and I have to wait for the results. And when in those days, you waited a long time. There's now a test that can give you an answer fast. But you wait so long for this test that you actually can feel the baby moving already. And uh, I didn't do this test lightly. It's a risky test. But I thought, if I don't have to have, a, if I know, I would not knowingly bring a baby into the world that has a genetic um, deformity. This was why I did it. And uh, if that's what ends up happening and I couldn't have prevented it or stopped it or known, that's fine. But my idea was that we have science for a reason and I'm going to use it. So I was sort of waiting for the test results and I had to call Hong Kong for the test results. And I remember um, calling, I was told to call at a certain time on a certain day to get the results and I was waiting and waiting and worrying because I was old and uh, I called and the nurse said there's a problem the doctor's not here he'll call you back and I went oh 
my God, there's a problem. And I just remember, you know, I had to wait two hours for the doctor to come back. And I just remember going, I, I just crying. I didn't know what I was going to do because, um, you know, I'd gone into it thinking, I am going to do this. But I thought, oh, I can't believe this. In the end, it was not a problem. She meant the problem is the doctor is out. <laughs> yes, it, it was a language. It was a language problem. But I, I confronted at that point the idea that oh, I might actually have to. I might actually not have this baby. I had to decide. Uh, and I thought it must be so hard for people to um, go through that kind of decision. You know, I thought, I thought I could do it. It would be no problem. I was rational. But when it um, actually happened to me, I thought, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not sure if I don't think there's a God or I don't know if there's a God. I'm not quite sure what I think. But I know when things get really bad, I sometimes have a little silent prayer just in case he's there or she's there. Uh, I have, you know, I just try everything. And so I have done that a couple of times, silently. I just sort of think, if you're there, could you help? <laughs> and uh, so I guess it's kind of hypocritical, because I only go when I really need something. I, I'm not like 24-7. <laughs> uh, so I guess I think it's part of human nature, too to hope that there is something more powerful. When things get really bad, maybe there's going to be a miracle. And I think that's just part of human nature. And I, I have it too, even though I'm such a skeptical person as a reporter. I always find it weird, like I have friends who are journalists who are deeply religious, like Catholic, they go to confession. I find that very odd. I don't see how you can reconcile one with the other. But I know that I, I can do it sometimes too. I think that as a journalist, I've been deeply influenced by early moral teachings and by Maoism because I feel this strong sense that human rights are important. So as a journalist, it's one of the things that I care about. I also care very much about freedom of the press. Um, so I am probably um, quite tough on people. Uh, one of the things I've been doing, I'm not doing it now anymore, but I did have a lunch column in which I took celebrities to lunch and I interviewed them. And it was, I was very tough. People thought I was very mean and nasty, but really what I was doing is I am trying to be the consumer reports of famous people. I feel there's too much puff journalism out there. There's too much celebrity worship. And uh, I felt I had to be tough on them. I have to be tough. This is a moral imperative. As a journalist, I'm not going to give them a free ad. And at the same time, I interview ordinary people, and I try to, I mean, anybody who's in trouble, I, will, I would love to write about them, because I feel this is one way to highlight an injustice. So I do two things. I'm tough on people who, uh, are arrogant or um, selfish. I mean, celebrities aren't all like that, but a lot of them are. And they, because nobody ever says no to them. Everybody's always bowing and scraping, and they lose all sense of reality. And for me, that's great because they they walk into lunch, they have no idea what's coming. People say to me, "You are so judgmental," and of course, the journalistic answer is, "Well, that's a column." We're allowed to have opinions, but really, the, the deeper answer is, yes, I am a very judgmental person, and I don't see what's wrong with that, actually. I think we should say outright, is this person good or bad? And I, I should say, it, as a journalist, it's gray sometimes. It's not always like that. But my attitude is, if I think the person um, needs skewering, I do not hesitate. How do I define evil? I think evil is something that hurts other people, that infringes on their human dignity. That's evil. Not letting them have what you have, that's evil. Um, 
so um, evil needs to be fought. And I think journalists have a real role in that. In totalitarian societies, they risk their lives to do that. Here, we just get emails. I think what brings me the most joy in life right now is my family, my children. Um, I have two little boys. They're not that little. They're, they're now nine and 12. And um, I guess they've given me a great perspective on life. I think people have kids for selfish reasons. And, uh, but one of the things that being a parent does is turn you into an unselfish person. You can't think of yourself anymore. You always have to think of your kids. And I think they've put perspective on everything for me, from all my work. You know, it's nothing. Work is nothing. It's much more important to, to take care of your kids and to be there for them. And I, I've done a lot in my career, but then I think that's not important. It doesn't matter. And uh, what really matters is having good kids. And I want, and I'm bringing them up. They don't go to Sunday school. My husband's, um, what do I say? He's Jewish, but he was not never raised in a religious way. And so I'm not bringing them up Jewish or Christian or anything, but I shouldn't say anything. The, the, what I'm bringing them up as is moral, moral citizens. I tell them they should be good people. I tell them there's a right and wrong. You know, little kids always try to take something home from school. So in kindergarten, my son would always take like a crayon or something. And as soon as I found it, we'd march him right back, poor kid, to the teacher. And I'd say, I'm not saying anything, but I will stand beside you. And you have to tell her what you did. And I think that comes from Sunday school. <laughs> but so and I tell them, you know, the God stuff, you can figure out for yourself. But human rights really is our religion, um, treating people properly. And I, and I tell them, you know, if there's a kid at school who's getting excluded, it's your job, it's your responsibility to make sure that ends. You don't have to be his friend by yourself. And I told him, I think the best solution is to get two or three of your friends and you together bring this kid into your group. Uh, so kids, uh, are very important because they expand you and they make you realize you're nothing. <laughs> you are not important. And it's the future that's important. You know, we have a lot of problems in the world, but if you can get two kids who are going to be moral citizens and try to make the country and the world a better place, then that's really the most important thing you can do.